we're so excited uh, to be here tonight at the National Press Club for a critical event to save the white bark pine. The title of tonight's event is Hope and Restoration, Saving the White Bark Pine, because we do have hope. The white bark pine, which was listed as an endangered species uh, back in December, is the widest ranging tree species uh, ever listed under the Endangered Species Act. And it's not just any tree, this is the tree that is the ecological keystone uh, to the mountain forest all across the western United States. So it's a tree that's critical to the future of our wildlife, of our water supplies, of high country recreation, and so much more. So we're so excited to be here launching this incredible film and we have more people and organizations than ever coming together to do this work. We've been working on this for decades, but this has to be our smelling salts moment where we say for all the great effort that we've been putting in, it isn't enough. This is a comeback story about how we're going to say this is the moment where we kind of reach bottom and now we rally together everything that we've learned and all the power in the organizations and people in this room and others who, who are going to rally to, to this cause um, and we do everything that's needed at the scale that it's needed to restore uh, the white bark pine. Um, and, and so just to give you a sense of, of, of why, we, why we've reached this moment, uh, there are some areas where there are many more uh, white bark pine trees dead than alive. Um, in some places, mortality rates uh, as high as 90%. There are uh, yet yeah, huge opportunities um, in that roughly 90% of the white bark pine range is on public lands. So as we address this crisis, a huge portion of where this work needs to happen uh, are places that we own and manage together um, as public lands. And so I think we should take that as part of the, uh, the opportunity even as we face this immense challenge. And so tonight we come together bringing a diversity of perspectives and a diversity of capacities um, to figure out how do we meld all that together into a response uh, that can win the day, that can save the white bark pine. Some of us are going to be out there working on the ground, whether it's uh, collecting the seeds and growing the resilient seedlings uh, that can be the next future generation of white bark pine uh, that can survive and withstand the stresses that have brought the species uh, to this point. Others will be involved in doing the planting and the management um, of white bark pine stands across the landscapes. Some of us are going to be leaders in public policy and, and know there are members of Congress and staff uh, here tonight. We're very grateful for the role that federal policymakers, state policymakers, tribal governments have played um, in being leaders uh, in the response. Corporate partners, and we have corporate partners in the room like Salesforce that have been funders and supporters of this work. And there's a role for everyone, including individual citizens, uh, out as volunteers like the Girl Scouts of the USA that have stepped up um, to be part of the response. This is truly a government's the Girl Scouts opportunity. And I would suggest in America right now, we don't just need to do this kind of work, but we need and for our, our, our ecosystems and for the, the environmental benefits that we can create and community benefits that we can create. But I'd also suggest there's something really powerful in the, the societal benefits that we get when we do this kind of work together. When diverse actors come together and figure out how we can co-create these solutions and we can implement them um, at scale. So we have an amazing evening ahead. Uh, in just a few minutes, you're going to have a chance to hear from the U.S. Forest Service, which has been a tremendous leader in catalyzing white bark pine recovery from figuring out some of the key scientific questions to leading on the ground restoration. Uh, then we're going to watch a, a special screening of Hope and Restoration, Saving the White Bark Pine, a truly a stunning film, award-winning film um, that we think is going to have a cut through uh, and bring this issue to new audiences with a new urgency, um, better than we've ever been able uh, to do it before. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge that this film was co-produced by the Cornell's uh, Lab for, uh, of Ornithology, their Center for Conservation uh, Media, and the Ricketts Conservation Foundation, which has been an immensely important partner uh, in this work. Uh, following the film, we're going to be joined by a diverse group of speakers uh, and, and panelists who are going to give us th uh, the story of white bark pine from lots of different perspectives, uh, tribal perspectives, uh, perspectives of researchers and scientists doing this work on the ground, uh, folks who are engaged from, uh, in, in this uh, place and in this work um, uh, through outdoor recreation. 
And so then we're going to transition from that panel um, to some closing remarks um, from Director Tracy Stone Manning of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and we'll make sure that we leave with some really clear next steps. What are the things that we need to be sure to do together uh, to, to save the white bark pine and make sure we also mark out a role for everyone uh, in doing this work and carrying the mo momentum of this evening um, out uh, into, uh, into this work uh, going forward. And so before I introduce um, our, our speaker from the U.S. Foresters, I just want to linger for a moment on the critical role of the Ricketts Conservation Foundation and make sure to introduce the foundation to you. Uh, founded by Joe Ricketts, uh, the Ricketts Conservation Foundation is a nonprofit foundation that's dedicated to working with private and public partners uh, to study, protect, and enhance uh, populations of at-risk spe at species. And we are really, really grateful that the Ricketts Conservation Foundation made white bark pine one of those at-risk species, species because you know, the different roles uh, that the Ricketts Conservation Foundation has uh, played in this work, um, helping make it possible and directly partnering uh, in, in this effort has, has just made an immeasurable difference. We're really, really grateful for it. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Rick Cooksey. Uh, Rick is the Director of Forest Health and Protection at the U.S. Forest Service, and it's really important to say that program has kind of been one of the catalysts for this whole effort, it, defining the problem, giving us the scientific vision uh, to carry the work forward, um, and, and making sure that our actions are strategic um, and innovative uh, all along the line. Um, and so I'm going to have Rick come up in just a second. I do also want to recognize David Lytle, who's here as well, who's Director of Forest and uh, Rangeland Management and Vegetation Ecology uh, for the U.S. Forest Service and plays a critical role in taking that kind of direction that's coming out of forest health and helping us implement it at scale, including across the national forest system. So with that said, uh, Rick, I'd like to invite you to come up. Well, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Rick Cooksey, and I work for the U.S. Forest Service in uh, forest health protection. And I wanted to talk to you just for a few minutes tonight about how much white bark pine, its restoration and conservation really means to us in the Forest Service. We have been on this road with you for quite a long time. We started working with uh, organizations uh, on this in 2005. And here we are today. We were working and we were looking at this resource uh, back in those days. And we said, you know, the world is changing, the environments are changing, and the impact is happening in the resource. What are we gonna do about that? And that's when we began to work in collaboration. So the question of, are we behind you in terms of the US Forest Service? Yes, we are. We're behind you in terms of uh, understanding and studying. We're behind you between survey, monitoring, um, and we're mostly behind you when it comes to action. What we do is, in forest health, we go from the monitoring and the survey, but yet we're working across all aspects of the Forest Service. This collaboration has actually created positive influences within our agency. We're not working within a stovepipe. We're working across our research and development arm. We work with our field staff and, and folks within the national forest system. And we do it with our forest health protection specialists, our pathologists who are out there in the field, with some of your, your folks, with volunteers, with people who work at the state. Um, and they are out there collecting cones. They're out there gathering information for genomic studies. They're out there helping to plant uh, seedlings and identifying just the right place that they might be successful. So when we're talking about white bark pine, okay, we're not just talking about kind of a, you know, uh, a bit of a twisty pine up there um, in the high elevations. As Jad said, we are talking about an iconic grandparent in the mountains. This tree is an indicator. It shows us, it tells us the state of what some of the impacts on our environments have been. Our fire management regimes, climate and its impacts, 
making the species vulnerable to insects, mountain pine beetle, diseases, one of the most uh, devastating of the species that's creating damage and mortality across, in the case of the Forest Service, over 58 million acres, seven states. That's a wide range, and it's an important resource. So we're working in several directions. We're now guided by working with, strongly with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and everything that is required within that listing. But that process is educated and enabled by the work and the partnership which we have had with the foundation and the American Forest. This work that we have done together to look at the science, to look at the areas, the core areas, to explore conservation strategies, and to enhance the work that we have been doing plus more, this is the foundation of, our, of where we can go in the future. So I'm really happy to be with you tonight. Thank you for having the Forest Service as a partner in this collaboration, and I look forward to working with you in the future for more success. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, at American Forests, we have a strong belief that communications is an underused superpower in the conservation movement. Uh, and that we need to spend more time thinking about how do we tell the stories of the work that we're doing in ways that can broaden uh, the communities that are coming to do this work with us. And, and within that, we have a belief that there's something about video that cuts through in a different way. We're all bombarded by so many words uh, these days that there's something about the power of uh, imagery and video uh, that, that, can, that can transcend, can cut through the smog, and, 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 can, and can bring us the traction that we need uh, with new audiences. And so I'm really excited uh, to introduce uh, Eric Liner, the producer and cinematographer for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who has created something that I think you'll agree uh, when you see it in a few moments, is a, is a truly exceptional uh, piece of storytelling in video, quite unlike, in some cases, anything you've ever seen before. Um, in, in this arena. So with uh, that, Eric, I'd like to introduce you and let you uh, introduce the film. Thank you. This is exciting. Exciting to see this film here tonight. Um, I'll share a little bit of a personal story before uh, we start. Um, I, I, had a, I learned a lot when I ma went making this film, uh, and a couple things in particular that I want to talk about. But uh, I, I prepared this, not sure how informed the audience would be, but maybe a show of hands. How many people came here tonight in advance of this event already familiar with white bark pine and knew something about it? Yes, yeah, so you guys are super informed. <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll admit that when the Ricketts Conservation Foundation uh, first approached us about working on this issue, I knew very little, uh, almost to the point that it was, it's kind of embarrassing to admit. Uh, and for me, it's a little bit embarrassing because I would say I spent a lot of time in some some formative years uh, living adjacent to white bark pine forests and often surrounded by white bark pine, um, but not being really aware that it was there or what it was. Um, so, you know, exploring in the Gallatin National Forest, through the Madison Range and parts of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, where white bark pine plays a really important role. So I would fish in rivers uh, where the water was being influenced by white bark pine forests that were just upslope. Um, I was skiing in the back country with snow under my feet that was being anchored by white bark pine, thankfully. Uh, seeing incredible wildlife that was you know, easy to appreciate and be fascinated by that were all there because of the connection to white bark pine. And so I was benefiting from white bark in all these ways, spiritually and, and physically, uh, and I wasn't aware that it existed. So this has been something that I've learned over the course of this project. And, and the big takeaway for me is that I've had sort of a long-standing love affair, if you will, with white bark pine without knowing it. And, and it's easy to happen because I think it's easy to sometimes look past uh, or take for granted trees. And uh, I, would, I would argue probably not as much with such an informed room as tonight, but I would say there's probably a lot of people out there that if they love places like Yellowstone National Park, and they love Glacier National Park, uh, if they love the Northern Rockies or the Northern Sierra or the Cascades, 
If you love to fish or hike or ski in these places or hunt in these areas, you probably love white bark pine also without knowing it. So that was one big thing that I, I took away and learned from this. Uh, the other is that uh, there is a really core group of people that have been committed for a long time, passionately committed and fiercely committed to the survival of this species. Um, and uh, getting to work with them and getting to learn from them over the course of this project uh, that they've understood for a long time about the importance of white bark pine. And they've understood for a long time that white bark pine is in trouble. And if something isn't done to, to stop the loss of white bark pine, it can have devastating effects on some of our cherished mountain landscapes. Um, so I'm excited that you'll be able to hear from some of these people tonight from the film and on the panel. And uh, I hope you come away as inspired as I am about this ecosystem uh, and recognize that, that uh, the future of white bark pine is in good hands. So with that, we'll, I think, bring the lights down. The evidence is abundant and irrefutable that people are drawn to wild lands. There's something that resonates in the human soul, in our human condition. And there is a particular resonance that comes from having white bark pine forests present. It is unique within a landscape that's unique. It has a sense of timelessness because you are walking through a forest of trees that are hundreds of years old. And what they offer on the landscape can't be replicated, it can't be duplicated in a short period of time. In a culture that seems to gravitate to the immediate, there is a longevity, a permanence that you find in white bark pine forests that even if we can't fully express it, draws us in. The thing that I admire and appreciate the most about white bark pine is its tenacity. You see this thing growing on the most amazing ridge tops and in these environments where no other tree can exist. We've been working with white bark pine for several years now, and I think of it like our people. Our people have survived. Our people are resilient. There's something really magical about being in a really high elevation place that's really windy and really inhospitable, and to see these giant, beautiful things thriving. White bark pine is almost exclusively a high elevation tree within its entire range. They're the craggy, gnarled trees that you see at Timberline. They're that top layer to the forest in the mountains all the way to the Sierras and Cascades and north into Alberta and British Columbia. If you are going hiking at high elevations, you've probably passed a white bark in the Western United States and not known it. If you are going backcountry skiing or if you're at many of the ski resorts in the Western United States, you've probably skied past a white bark and not known it. Where white bark pine grows, its canopies redistribute snow. The shade from their crowns will preserve that snow well into the summer. These forests actually stabilize the snowpack, allowing the snow to melt slower and provide high quality water for longer periods during the summer. In this area, a lot of folks downstream rely on that snow melt for their irrigation water, for their culinary water, to replenish the water in the water table. White bark pine has so many benefits, but probably the most important ecosystem service that white bark provides is a wildlife food source. A white bark cone is about four or five inches long and they are very sappy. 
but the magic is what's inside the cone. White Park produces these unbelievably large seeds, the largest seed of any tree that we have in the Northern Rockies. Because the cones are large with a big nut, a lot of animals rely on them, and the grizzly bears love it. They're trying to put on fat for going into the den for a winter period. They need to gain as much weight as possible. And the white bark pine offers them a large return for the energy expended to receive it. And we have enough data after many years of research to know that they are inexorably tied to the white bark pine. Hey, Bear. You're in the midst of a white bark pine forest here. When it's a good white bark year, this is a, a wildlife hub. So this is a real important area for bears, for red squirrels, but the nutcrackers are arguably the most spectacular. I think that the most interesting thing about white bark that really catches people's attention is the fact that the tree could not exist without this bird that plants its seeds. Almost all the white bark pine reproduction up and down the Rocky Mountain chain is due to nutcrackers caching the seeds. So this forest really depends on the bird. The nutcracker will come along and remove the seeds from the cone. And then they bury small clusters of these seeds pretty much everywhere in the high mountain environment. They stash these seeds, sometimes up to tens of thousands of caches, and no one can believe that they can recover these things, but they do. They don't get them all though. And so some of those caches grow into white bark pine, and most of white bark pine is established that way. And so the two are intertwined. So it's a really very important relationship and it's starting to fall apart. It's falling apart because the white barks are dying for multiple reasons. And it's exemplified here. Everything I look out and see as dead is white bark. Since the start of my career, the decline of white bark pine is just breathtaking. In areas, we've lost over 90 to 95% of these trees. I began to see whole entire upper watersheds die. It was heartbreaking to see that. You go out there and it's really hard to find a healthy tree on the landscape. It's just, it's depressing. It's everything from these little tiny seedlings that are less than a foot tall all the way up to the biggest trees on the landscape. And every single one of them virtually has white pine blister rust. White bark pine is facing extinction primarily because of white pine blister rust. White pine blister rust is this non-native fungus that infects a tree through its needles and slowly creates these cankers that then cut off the flow of nutrients and water, killing limbs. Over time, that spreads and will kill an entire tree. This disease has been spreading through white bark pine for nearly a century. This is the main existential threat to white bark pine. I think if you look back on some of the history of diseases like this, pathogens that have gone through North America, the classic case is chestnut blight, which came into the eastern U.S. in the late 1800s. And 40 years later, there were no American chestnut left in the, in the forest. If we fail to do anything for white bark pine, we are going to end up with many regions of our high mountain areas without it. And we lose the ecosystem services, the wildlife food, the habitat protection, the watershed protection. It will be very apparent that some cataclysm affected our western forests mightily on a large scale.
I don't think I'll need it. So as we're coming in here to set up, we're looking for trees that we know to be genetically resistant to blister rust. So these are the ones we're gonna be caging in today. We have no cure for white pine blister rust. And the only recourse we have is to look for the small number of individuals in each population that seems to have natural genetic resistance. Those individuals are the foundation of restoring white bark pine. These cones will be shipped to the Coeur d'Alene Nursery in Idaho and eventually used to grow seedlings in the nursery. The seedlings we are growing have some level of resistance to blister rust. On average, we're growing about 150,000 seedlings per year. 150,000 one-year-old seedlings, 150,000 two-year-old seedlings. When we plant trees, the first thing is we really look for an excellent planting location. We're looking for a log that's down or maybe a stump, something that's gonna provide shade and hold some moisture and give it the best, the best life and the best start that it can have. It's very gratifying to go out and see these seedlings on the landscape. It is very humbling, I'll say, that we are having such an impact. And in this special case of white bark pine, where this is a threatened species, we're able to recreate it and put it back on site. I have a lot of hope for the future of white bark pine because I see the passion in the people who are working to restore it. They're doing the research, planting trees, collecting cones, growing all the seedlings. And I look at all these marvelous, passionate, committed people, and I can't help but have hope. We have a lot of people that care about the fate of this tree, but we're realistic because we've moved an inch and we know that we've got a mile to go. I am incredibly optimistic about the future of white bark. I am incredibly sad about what the landscape looks like currently, but I can't imagine looking at this as the death knells. It's not. Restoration is totally possible. We've done it, we are doing it, and we'll continue to do it. I want to be able to leave something for the next generation so that they can participate and see what I'm seeing and experience what I experience. When you're up at that high elevation and you're sitting in a white bark pine stand, and the Clark nutcrackers are flying around and it's just, it's magical. And I shouldn't be the only one who gets to experience that. You got to think like, you know, this is not just for me. It's for the future generation. The forestry program for the first time in our history planted 2,000 trees. I won't see those trees mature, but our grandchildren and our children are gonna see those trees mature. And that's to me what it's all about. About 90% of white bark pine occurs on public lands in the United States. So it's critically important that we as public land management agencies are actively involved in white bark pine conservation. I think the responsibility to restore white bark pine rests with us all. No matter where the pine grow, we all have an obligation to make sure that this species, which is just so critical for high elevation habitat, doesn't wink out on our watch. The more that I've worked with white bark, the more that I have hope because I understand now that there are things we can do about it. We have a plan forward. We know how to restore the species. Now we need the resources to do that. One of my favorite quotes, it goes, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit.
How many people saw something they've never seen before in that, in that movie, <laughs> right? Absolutely incredible. What, Eric, what an amazing job your team did uh, creating that film, uh, just, just spectacular. Well, uh, now we have an opportunity to hear from some of the people actually uh, who are in the film um, and some other uh, fantastic leaders uh, for, for White Bark Pine. And so um, we're going to have a uh, panel discussion. And so I'm going to introduce the panelists one by one, have them come up, and then, um, and then we'll talk about uh, this work and, and how we can get it right uh, going forward. Um, so first, um, I want to introduce uh, Conrad Anker. Uh, he's made a specialty of climbing some of the most technically challenging terrain in the world. And this search has taken him from the mountains of Alaska and Antarctica to the big walls of Patagonia and Baffin and the massive peaks of the Himalayas. He's summited Everest three times. In 2011, Conrad, Jimmy Chin, and Renan Oosterk uh, summited one of the last great unclimbed features of the Himalayas by topping out on the shark's fin route on the northwest face of 20,700-foot Meru in the Garwa Himalaya. Based in Bozeman, Montana, Conrad is a member of the North Face Athlete Team and is active in numerous charitable causes. He serves on the board of Protect Our Winters, a great organization, uh, Memphis Rocks, and the American Himalayan Fund. Please welcome Conrad Anker. Super. So <laughs> it's like I put him off in the corner or something there. Uh, so next, I get to introduce uh, Dr. Douglas W. Smith, uh, who is a former senior wildlife biologist for Yellowstone National Park, who retired in 2022 after 28 years of service. He supervised the park's wolf, bird, and elk programs and was the project leader for the Yellowstone Wolf Project, which helped restore wolves to Yellowstone National Park. He's in, published a wide variety of journal articles and book chapters on beavers, wolves, elk, and birds. And Doug is an avid canoeist who travels in the remote regions of northern Canada with his wife, Christine, and their two sons, Sawyer and Hawken. Uh, welcome, Doug. Next, we have Sheena Shaw Pete from the Navajo Nation. She was born uh, East Shawnee and Irish. Sheena Shaw has researched white bark pine since her time as an undergraduate at Salish Kootenai College, where she graduated with her BA in forestry fire management. In 2019, she took the lead of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes white bark pine restoration program. Under her leadership, she's made this the top tribal rest, uh, white bark pine restoration program. Uh, Sheena Shaw's goals are to continue strengthening uh, her restoration program while helping other tribes implement white bark pine restoration, develop a student white bark pine education camp, and help save white bark pine habitats for the next seven gen generations ahead. Please welcome Sheena Shaw. Next, we have uh, Dr. Walter Wetchy. Uh, he has worked in the Western United States for most of his professional career, despite growing up in Connecticut. Uh, he majored in forestry at the University of Vermont before moving west and obtaining an MA and PhD in biogeography from UCLA and the University of California, Riverside. Walter has conducted research in several US states, Canada, Mexico, Mongolia, and Peru. Since, working, uh, since joining the Ricketts Conservation Foundation in early 2018, Walter has worked to expand the organization's commitment to conservation, working with partners within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and adjoining, Welter, uh, adjoining Western states. Please welcome Walter. And finally, we have Dr. Diana F. Tomback. Uh, Diana is the Professor of Integrative Biology uh, at the University of Colorado, Denver. Her research is focused on forest ecology and conservation biology, and, and she's truly been a global leader on whitebark pine. Through her doctoral research, she discovered whitebark pine depends on, on the Clark's Nutcracker for seed dispersal. In 2001, Diane and her colleagues started the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, another fantastic organization, a science-based nonprofit. Diana has served as a volunteer director of the foundation for 17 years and currently oversees policy and outreach. 
Through the foundation, she has led the development of white bark pine health survey methods and helped bring the attention, uh, bring white bark pine uh, decline attention uh, uh, to the attention of federal agencies. She's also a key organizer of the White Bark Pine, uh, National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan, developed in partnership with American Forests and in consultation with the U.S. Forest Service. Please welcome Diana. Super. Well, we feel so fortunate to have you all today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we want to start uh, on the community and cultural significance of, of the white bark pine. Um, and and if we'd like to start with uh, Conrad uh, and uh, Shina uh, Shinasa on, on this. Um, and um, Shina Shaw, excuse me. Um, and, the, and, and the white bark pine, and get into uh, how this species uh, is important to the communities of interest that you work with. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, where do you see uh, the future of this work going? Ladies first. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, hey, everybody. Hello. Um, thank you for the question. I appreciate it, definitely. The um, importance of white bark pine culturally connecting and the biggest component that I try to push out as I am spreading the word about white bark pine is for white bark pine, we have a symbiotic relationship just with all the Native American cultures as well to the earth. And my biggest thing is if we lose white bark pine, it's going to have the cultural effect on us as well, aside from the ecosystem. If we lose white bark pine, we're going to lose the story in our culture for it, not just only within the Salish and Kootenai, call, or the Salish and Kootenai tribes, but all the other tribes that have white bark pine within their ecosystems and their landscapes. If we're going to lose the cultural component of white bark pine, we're going to lose our culture. When we lose our culture, we're going to lose the name of white bark pine in the language of those tribes. We're going to lose the story that's coming with it. Once we lose that, we're going to lose the animals that reply upon us as well, that help balance this ecosystem. So it goes from the beginning all the way to the top with the white bark pine, just like the ecosystem and all the way down to the effects of it. So going out into our communities and spreading it, um, the information amongst all of the communities and tribal members, my biggest, my biggest target is the children. As I say um, in my introduction, seven generations ahead. We look for seven generations ahead, not just one generation, because we want to have this last for seven generations ahead, example, 200 years. We are fighting for sustainability within our forests for white bark pine ecosystems. 200 years later, we still have white bark pine here for our culture and for everybody else. That is true sustainability. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Conrad. Yeah, and thank you. Um, I come from a recreation background, so in, uh, uh, Eric's uh, wonderful film there, there was all these uh, clips of going up to the Petzl Caves and the Grand Tetons. And whenever I go there to climb the Grand Teton, I camp at that one spot. And those trees, the white bark pine there, are like old friends. Um, I think about all the other climbers and adventurers that had come before and slept below those trees, and it was a part of it. For me, on a personal level, when I get to the white bark pine, it's all of a sudden a transformation. I've left the the noise of civilization and everything we're overtaxed with, and I'm there for rejuvenation. Listening to the Clark's Nutcracker in here and, and listening to the wind in the pine trees, we just didn't have the smell, um, really brings that back. And it's restorative and it, it provided me with a sense of balance. Um, one thing from a recreation standpoint, white bark pine is a sought after elevation for backcountry skiing. The trees are spaced well enough apart um, as Eric mentioned, they hold the snow securely on there so you're, you can ski it safely. And by seeing these areas in there that, that people go to recreate there, and we now see recreation is what we do. It's how we identify ourselves more so than our work. So for myself, being able to give something back to the forest that provides rejuvenation for me is, is the right thing to do. So. Happy. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, and so what we want to turn now to is uh, the ecosystem and wild, uh, wildlife connections and the critical role that white, white bark pine plays as this ecological keystone uh, for these high elevation areas. And so uh, 
Uh, Diana, Doug, and Walter, you've all devoted uh, extensive uh, time to, uh, to discerning those connections and understanding how, how do we work at that intersection. And so, Diana, I want to start with you. Um, what do we mean when we say white bark is a keystone in foundational species, and wh why is it so ecologically important? Well, I'm going to be sciencey for just a moment, so forgive me. Um, the keystone species technically is a species that provides a resource that attracts many other species. In the case of white bark pine, as we saw in the film, it's the large Patricia seed uh, that is a preferred seed source for many small birds, and mammals, but also carnivores. Recently, we learned red foxes use them, black bears, grizzly bears. Uh, so uh, we, it, it is promoting diversity in these communities. Now, foundation species, that's a slightly more abstract technical term. Uh, foundation species are those that provide structure uh, and uh, stability to ecosystems, and white bark pine certainly does that. Uh, after disturbance, particularly wildfire, thanks to Clark's nutcrackers, white bark pine comes in very rapidly. You all saw how white bark pine can tolerate harsh conditions. Well, after disturbance, such as fire, it can be the first species in and provide shelter for other species leading to community development. So that's very important. The other aspects of white <coughs> bark that are critical, uh, they grow at the head of watersheds, the canopies, uh, as we saw in the video, uh, shade snowpack, and so snow melt is protracted, guaranteeing water downstream through the, into the late summer. Also stabilizes soil. So white bark is very important, and I don't know uh, how we would compensate for the loss of all these in our forests. Great, thank you so much. And, and so Doug, you're perhaps best known for your work in, in bringing wolves back to Yellowstone uh, National Park, and Walter, much of your research is focused on birds and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So how has that work helped you understand the interconnected relationships between white bark pine and other species? Okay, well thank you for that. I'm here on behalf of Yellowstone National Park, even though I just retired. And admittedly, I know the least about white bark pine of anybody up here, but somehow I still got myself up on the stage. And uh, <laughs> so this is maybe a little bit tangential to white bark pine, but I've spent my career following wolves around and other furry things, not uh, trees. And one thing we notice is white bark pine is critical to this high elevation ecosystem that a lot of wildlife use that was featured in the film, things like grizzly bears and red squirrels and things of the like, but we uh, noticed an interesting relationship that was centered on white bark pine that you wouldn't expect in Yellowstone National Park. And because, as was featured in the film, white bark pine is critical to grizzly bears for their fall food source, but the key thing is you can't count on the white bark being good every year. Some years it's good, other years it's not, I'm not quite sure why. Others tell me it's due to like throw the insects off so they can't build up and eat everything. But this messes the bears up, probably the red squirrels too, but we weren't studying that. And so when the bears don't have this delicious food source of the pine nuts that primarily the red squirrels cache, they move down in elevation and they steal wolf kills. So this was what I was studying in Yellowstone for a long time, then ended up studying the Clark's Nutcracker too, but watching these wolves, some years in August, September, October, there's a lot of grizzly bears around stealing wolf kills. And grizzly bears always win in these battles. <laughs> so the wolves are losing food to the grizzly bears. Mm. Other years, there's no grizzly bears around because the white bark pine crop up high is good. So it's this perfectly, and I mean almost perfectly, inverse relationship between good and bad white bark and good and bad bear rating on wolf kills. So this used to be thought to be this kind of isolated, high elevation ecosystem. Oh no, you know, if we've read anything, pull on one thing in nature and it all comes apart and it pulls in everything else. There are ripple effects from these high elevation white bark pine communities to lower elevation wolf prey communities that affect their kill rates, which affect their kill rates on other things. 
And I don't have time to get into that, but who would have expected this? Tree and bird, boom, grizzly bears and wolves. Very cool. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Walter. Yeah, and so actually what Doug pointed out is that species don't exist in isolation and that we have these interactions that we might not be aware of, but which have large impacts that are often unforeseen. And when uh, Joe Ricketts hired me to be the director for the Ricketts Conservation Foundation, he wanted me to work uh, or identify projects that the foundation could work on in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And this was just when, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when this actually uh, came up as an opportunity to do some research on the Clark's Nutcracker and how they move throughout the landscape in relation to white bark pine abundance and alternate food sources, it seemed to me like here was something that the Ricketts Conservation Foundation could do a lot to help our understanding and also publicize the work that's being done. And so that is really one of the aspects of the work that I'm allowed to do because of Joe's incredible generosity hiring me for some reason. But um, I really uh, find that this was, when, I, when it was identified for me, it was just sort of, wow, here's, here's an opportunity for us to really do a lot of good in the area. We've thrown around a lot of big numbers about the decline, but we wanted to kind of uh, give that a little bit more color and a character from what you all are seeing um, and how this decline is playing out in the landscapes that you're most familiar with and, and that you're living in. And, and so Sheena Shaw, if you'd be willing to lead off on this, and you, know, you talked about the impacts on the community um, you know, from the uh, decline of white bark pine, but just to kind of characterize for folks what you're seeing um, in, your, in your community uh, in terms of the loss of white bark pine, then have others uh, jump in and share their experiences of, uh, of what they're seeing and how it's, and how it's impacting uh, things that they care about. Okay, yeah. Um, so I work for the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes up in northwestern Montana. Um, we are along the um, about two hours north or south, excuse me, of Glacier National Park. We are right along Flathead Lake. I don't know if any of you guys who are familiar with the area or have heard of it, but um, the Flathead Indian Reservation is 1.3 million acres and about 160, about 170 of, um, thousand acres of that is forested land and about 105,000 of those acres is actually white bark pine habitat. So within, since I started working in 2019, um, just within the small amount of acres that I have worked in would say probably about um, even that I have got to scout and have done recon in, as I want to say roughly under maybe 500 acres so far. So I still have a lot of acreage to go and get out there and get to, but also at the same time, our white bark pine is growing from 4,000 to 8,000 feet elevation and there's only me out there. <laughs> I'm trying to scale these, um, these mountain sides and stuff to get this, but um, within those, that time, I have seen a depletion of probably about half of those acres already being infected by blister rust. For example, there is one area that I have been working in, it's about 30 acres, and within, since 2019 to today, um, I just actually had to go do recon before snow hit, with it, we've lost 90% of all of those 20 acres due to white bark pine blister rust. So it is devastating declining. And, um, and you know, with me out there just <laughs> trying to race and save it all, but um, it, is, it is devastating to see, and it is still yet hard to get people to grasp that as well with them. Um, within the tribal forest service that I work with and as well as um, the, in the wildlife as well because not too many people are going to get up there in those higher elevations to see it for themselves. Right. So, so we are consistently trying, I'm trying to consistently get out there to show the effects of how quick um, the border of the white bark pine habitat is slowly shrinking down. Thank you, that's so helpful. Uh, Conrad, do you, you want to share any observations or just kind of what, what you and other recreationists are seeing firsthand in, in high, high elevation areas? Um, probably the most obvious one is when I visit Grand Teton National Park, once a year I climb the Grand Teton. It's a, what I love to do. And the individual trees there, we'll see the bare bone packets that have been stapled there. There's oftentimes an inventory number. So these trees are numbered, we're watching them. And when I come back, I mean, before I, we all enjoyed white bark, we were out there, we, we found rejuvenation, but now that we know these trees and the state they're in, looking at each individual one, trying to understand what blister rust is, and on my end, to create motion, we need to get 
lifestyle involved with it. We have the data. We know what's going on. But what moves lifestyle is action by people, people being invested in something, seeing something that they want to do and be part of that. The partnership with the Girl Scouts is a great start with that. Salish Kootenai, Confederate Tribes, another example, the good work that Forest Service is doing. So the more that we bring all of our different groups in to, to work on this one uh, subject, the better off we'll be. Fantastic. Uh, thanks. That's really helpful. And, and Doug, how about Yellowstone National Park? What were some of the things uh, kind of characterized for people, some of the things that we're seeing there? I mean, I can be brief on this one. Just a couple comments. I mean, I spend a lot of my time flying around an airplane tracking wolves, elk, and birds. And again, I backed into looking at white bark pine. You couldn't help but notice over my roughly 30-year career just trees dying and entire valleys and mountain slopes becoming kind of skeletons, you know, white skeletons, and that was White Park dying. And the other thing you see, and I won't talk about it a lot, but Walter and Diana and I are working on a Clark's Nutcracker study. It's, it's midstream. We're still trying to figure that out. But what is it doing to the birds? What's happening to the birds that use the White Park? And what's important about that is, you know, a big part of the U.S. National Park Service is coming there for visitor enjoyment. And when you see these nutcrackers flying around in the fall, with their cheek pouches full of white pipe barn nuts, it doesn't matter if you know about trees or ornithology, it's a wonder of nature. Just pure awe. You don't have to be a scientist. All you gotta do is look up and hear their cries, see them, and that is something that we're trying to get on top of, and that's something we're worried about too. Super. Well, I said earlier in the evening that we were here tonight uh, to start the comeback, uh, you know, to focus on, on how we get this right going forward. And so let's, let's turn to restoration. Um, and Diana, I'd love, to, I'd love to cue you in on this one and get into what's needed to reverse this trend of loss. And you've been such a great leader in the development of the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan, really a roadmap to restoration um, that's being created. Um, and so t can you talk about what are the steps that are needed to, to recover white bark pine? Sure. Well, first of all, um, the U.S. Forest Service deserves credit because it's been working on ways to restore white bark pine for over a quarter of a century. So the tools and the treatments we have really have come out of uh, researchers and management from the Forest Service. Um, so one of the, the huge challenge of restoring white bark pine is this range of white bark pine in the U.S. That's about 56 million acres. So we have to restore white bark pine efficiently. Uh, we have to use funding and personnel as efficiently as we can. So that was the impetus for the National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan. So a little background. The White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation and American Forests uh, approached the US Forest Service, um, this was in 2016, and said, we have an idea. Uh, and this idea, then we were told to go forward. And um, with this plan, uh, it is in consultation with the U.S. Forest Service, which is the largest land manager. Uh, I believe it's 74% of white bark pine. Um, but also as partners, we have the National Park Service and the Bureau of Land Management and some tribal jurisdictions, and especially the Salish Kootenai. So our idea was, what if each of these jurisdictions identified 20 to 30% of their white bark, priority white bark pine. So we call these core areas. And if they focus their funding and their manpower, person power, on um, restoring white bark in these core areas, it's the idea that the Clark's Nutcracker would do the heavy lifting. So first of all, I will remind people of what's causing the decline of white bark pine. White pine blister rust, this exotic fungus originally from Siberia, a native pest, mountain pine beetle, that is being fueled by climate change and warming temperatures. We just got through about a 20 year huge outbreak. But also changing fire, megafires, wildfires, they're a threat to white bark pine, and then climate change, which has been pushing just about all of this. All right, so. The existential threat, as I said in the video, is really white pine blister rust. It attacks seedlings, saplings, mature trees. 
A small percentage of white bark pine have resistance to white pine blisterous. We have to find them. This is like looking for a needle in a haystack. And um, it is costly to do this. It takes about five years to confirm that a tree has genetic resistance. But these trees that have resistance, and you saw folks climbing them, collecting the seeds, are the foundation of the restoration plant. So seeds are gathered, seedling is grown, and then they are planted. As far as these other things, yes, we can protect some of these resistant trees against mountain pine beetle. We don't want the beetle to kill them. And we can plant white bark where it will grow, even with climate change, because we know places that are more resistant, cooler sites, for example. So it's not a loss. We know what to do. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the national plan uh, is very important. And now the Fish and Wildlife Service, because White Park is listed, will be coming up with a recovery plan. So um, we hope for synergism with the two. Fantastic. Thank yeah, thank you for spelling out uh, some, both some of those key actions that we need to take, but also how the plan will help us organize. Uh, and Shinahaj, uh, I would love to um, come back to you and, um, uh, and, and have you talk a bit more about how, how are you advancing these efforts on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Western Montana and, and approaching some of these issues of finding resilient uh, uh, seeds and, and growing resilient seedlings and helping to advance uh, restoration. I put on my cape and I go out there. <laughs> no, so um, um, so I've been working with 2019 since 2019 for the Confederate Sage Kootenai Tribe, and since then I have been going out. I I tried to find interns through the Salish Kootenai College, the Tribal College that's near, um, to go out there and find the scouting efforts in these high elevation places to yes recon and to scout. We've identified resistant. Uh, white bark trees out there to the blister rust. So from there, I have been going out, and um, not myself, but I have my little team of climbers that I have, and we've been going out and collecting, and we've and I've taken the program full circle from the collecting to cones, caging the cones, collecting the cones, sending them out for research, um, for genetic testing, but as well as bringing them back and growing seedlings, sowing, and then planting. So I have taken full circle with the restoration efforts for white bark pine on the Indian Reservation. We have planted over 2,000 seedlings um, in one area that has a high, culture, um, a high cultural um, significance as well. That's another thing that I've been trying to do with our restoration program is to put in our plantations in these high cultural significant areas to bring back the cultural component with it as well. And another effort that I'd be doing for this restoration as well is going out and trying to help build a curriculum with the schools and the communities around the area to implement more white bark pine research into their science programs, as well as trying to develop a white bark pine cultural camp, not only for students, but as well as for um, or the adult community members as well within the tribe to help them establish um, not only the restoration efforts as well for the tree, but also to help restore um, the culture. So I call it biocultural restoration. Fantastic, thank you. Well, and so let's move to the topic of collaboration. And so how do we take all of these different amazing efforts, including the ones that you just described, and knit them all together in the most powerful possible uh, collaboration? And so uh, Walter and Doug wanted to bring you both in here and talk about, uh, you've had the opportunity to observe and be part of different kinds of public-private partnerships around research and restoration and knitting these things together and, and how to fill resource gaps. And so can you talk to some of the experiences that you've had, maybe Walter, starting with you, um, and what are the kind of critical success factors as we knit these, these work together with the right kinds of partnerships? Yeah, I think one of the th most important things is to identify a uh, situation or a project where um, private funding can make a difference. Because I think one of the challenges that we have with a lot of conservation, especially if it's done by government agencies, you have a funding cycle, you have to make sure that the legislation gets approved and then the funding comes through. You have, there's a lot of lag time. And when we have conservation issues, they don't follow a funding cycle. They don't, many of them are long term. You know, you, you can't tell a graduate student, hey, do you want to study this problem for 10 years and then maybe get a PhD? Uh, that's not going to happen. So, so we have this 
problem where we have both a short term needing to have rapid response, but also having a long term, necessary long term funding. And I think that's where a private organization like the Ricketts Conservation Foundation can come in and do two things. One, work with a partner like Diana Tombeck and, and Doug Smith here to look at what are the Clarkson Nutcrackers doing in the absence of white bark pine, but also commit to funding that for a longer period of time so that we can get the answers. And the way that it worked with Doug, Doug can talk a little bit about the initiation of this, but I think that when we have the opportunity to come in and help, we also can do the, the work here with, with helping to publicize what's going on. And I think one of the amazing things about this collaboration is that uh, I think this film shows all the different people and organizations, dedicated individuals, both private and public, who are working really hard. And that, I think, is where an organization like Ricketts Conservation Foundation can, can have a very large impact and really help out. And I think Doug can talk a little bit about you know, how the, the, the genesis of our, uh, inter, uh, our interaction here. Fantastic. Thank you. It's so helpful to talk about the unique role that philanthropies can play. Fantastic. Doug. Great. Thank you for that segue. Quick, quick story, working for the federal government, conservation is chronically underfunded. It's just your daily bread when you work for the government. You don't have enough money. And so Diana, who was knocking around the park working on White Bark Pine, I'm in the office across the hall from the White Bark Pine guy for Yellowstone. I hear her in there, start talking with her about Clark's Nutcrackers for years, because in addition to wolves, I got assigned birds in 2008. We need, I knew about white bark pine, in trouble. We gotta do something about the bird. Diana and I started talking about it for literally years. Office chit chat, what are we gonna do? One day, I bump into Walter at a conference in Big Sky. Hey, do you wanna fund a Clark's Nutcracker study? Sure, and I'm like, <laughs> what? This just doesn't happen, you know, because we're grant writing and that takes a ton of time and you have a success rate of 10 to 50%. This is Hall Talk, hit pay dirt, enter Joe Ricketts. Joe is very interested in this, helps us fund the study. I'm a science guy like Diana, science, science, science. I meet Joe, easygoing, gentle soul, and he looks at me and goes, science isn't good enough. You need to do a little bit more. Maybe this is simplifying and maybe this is overstating, but the film you just saw and a companion film to it, focusing on Clark's Nutcrackers, was made. Eric got up, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. These films have come to fruition. Short American ten attention spans, doesn't matter. Two, both of these films are going to show back to back in two visitor centers in Yellowstone all day, all summer long. This is pay dirt. This is, we've got to take the science, spoon feed it to the public so they'll get it. And keep in mind, I'm a wolf guy. Yellowstone is about large mammals, geology, and history. Nothing known about these high elevation, far out of the way ecosystems. No one thinks about it or sees. They're not sexy. They're not iconic. These two short films was Joe saying to us, now I'm simplifying, because there's a rich history of white bark pine stuff. Our concern was we got to get the bird involved. Joe's like, thank you for the science, not good enough. You need to go the extra step. This is one of those steps yeah. that we hope to push out. There's a companion film, Clark's Nutcrackers, and I do have to do one shout out for my close friend who couldn't be here, Dan Tires. He had that opening dialogue. He's a thinker and a reader and has been traveling those mountains since he was a small boy. Was that good public outreach and communication? So that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. I'm a science guy. That doesn't work anymore. It's science plus marketing the science. It's a yeah. hard word for me to say as a scientist. <laughs> marketing. Right. But this was a shot at that. So the public-private yeah. partnership put this over the top. I'm sorry, to, I didn't mean to talk yeah. so much on no time for this year, no, no, no. but as a this government guy, this took us over the top, and Joe coming to me and looking me in the eye, not good enough, that shook me up. Yeah. Look what happened. 
Fantastic, and, and actually it, it, it segues perfectly into the next thing. So Conrad and Sheena Shah, I want to get into the mass mobilization side of this. How do we make sure that, that the way we build this uh, campaign has a role for everyone and feels inviting to everyone and that we're, we're connecting with all the communities that want to be part of this and everyone can find their role and, um, and, 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 feels, and feels welcome in it. And so um, I invite either of you to kick us off, but just thoughts about how we need to think about uh, the way that we build these partnerships so that they're engaging and welcoming for, for all sorts of diverse interests and, and participants. <laughs> Um, my big thing is the kids. It's it's the kids that I'm really wanting to get out there to. Um, and once back again, the the cultural component of it. I mean, the tribal person up here. <laughs> it's like, but yes, it's it's. Uh, and I tell them this because, and um, just for the all the communities as well. I mean, uh, the inspiration to show out there that yes, this work is actually being done. We actually have people out there on the ground. This is what we're accomplishing. This is what has been lifted so far since. It, we, you don't want to always have the dread, the dread, dread, dread. So that's the one thing I really try to avoid from because we know it's there. We want to be inspired. We want to be encouraged. And this is where I reach out there to those kids, as I say, seven generations ahead. White bark pine, uh, we're putting in our efforts. But yes, I will never see anything grow and mature that I have planted in my time. So this is why I'm reaching out to these youths and to the younger generations because they're the ones who are going to be coming back. They're the ones who need to be following our footsteps to keep it going. They're, they're going to be the ones who are going to be inspiring others continuously to keep this going as we are here now. And so this is my biggest effort is to, yes, get out there to those youth, to the, um, get them out there in the field. It is a recruitment for forestry fields as well. Um, it is a re and, and forestry is such a huge field that um, it's not just out there pulling data from trees or cutting down trees or, or you know, it, it's, it's, it's so much more to it and with the cultural side of it as well. That is where I try to get out there and show them that, yes, you do have a part in this. Whether you are talking to the person in the elevator next to you and telling them, hey, you ever hear about White Park Pine? Or, hey, well, that sounded like a Clark's Nutcracker. Do you know what a not like Narks, excuse me, <laughs> a Clark's Nutcracker is? But it's just even a simple sharing of a story, um, a simple, amazing data fact. It is just, yes, getting that knowledge out there to everybody. And that is the biggest efforts for that community support, that collaboration. And this is what I'm constantly pushing aside from the cultural component of it as well. Thank you. That's so helpful. Conrad, what is it going to take to get the recreation community all in here? Well, it's more than just recreation. We are social creatures. We like to interact with other people. We really felt that after COVID. We got back and we were there together. And Doug, I got news for you. Marketing isn't a four-letter word. <laughs> I've spent my, my job job as I do marketing, and so I like to bring that in here. But everything is marketing. Our government markets itself around the world, and it's in one way or another. And what, if we can, through this awareness, and we can find the social leaders, people that are out there that stand behind the white bark pine and lend it their voice, lend their voice to that, and then bring other people in there. And that is where <clears throat> our meeting here from yesterday to today, we're collaborating. How can we get ideas? How can we get different groups into this? How can we have someone that lives in Georgia care about the white bark pine trees? What are these ways that we can bring people together? Fantastic. All right, warm up your questions because you're going to have a moment for answer questions. Everybody gets one sentence. Maybe you can cheat and do two. What, do you, what makes you feel hopeful um, about our ability to save the white bark pine? Comrade, we'll take you right down the line. Okay. Um, dedication of, of enthusiasts to working on the trees. I work for the U.S. National Park Service, our mission's preservation, preserving that wonder of nature of a Clark's knockracker flying overhead, cheek pouches full, got to get it done. These are like tweets I'm starting to feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheena Shaw. Um, perseverance. Perseverance and adaptation and take that helping hand when it's there. You've got to be as tenacious as White Park, right? Oh, yeah. yes. I okay. think the fact that we got involved, all the organizations got involved before it was too late. 
I think the fact that thankfully the white, the white pine blister rust is a fairly slow moving disease, which means that there's the opportunity to get it, you know, to, to, to get the white bark pine protected. Awesome. You're an appropriate person to back clean up for us here, Dan. What would you yeah, say? Yeah, well, since everyone has already <laughs> said what I think. <laughs> I, I do, this may take two sentences. Uh, that's so okay. <laughs> we have some new technologies on the horizon. Yeah. And, uh, for example, David Neal, who's director of our foundation, uh, is organizing the genomics project for white bark pine. And we think we can fast track the identification of resistant genes in white bark and also climate adaptation genes. This is huge. This will speed things up and cost a whole lot less. So cross your fingers. Thank you. <laughs> so the tweet is the power of innovation, right? We can, we can get smarter and more efficient the way we do this. We, we can use technology to help. Yeah. get us out of this. Fantastic. Fantastic. Right. Okay, great. So uh, any questions uh, from the audience? So Conrad, I'm thinking with your marketing background, you know, uh, not to put you on the spot here, but you might be a good one to take the first crack anyway. Yeah, they're finding people that care about it. So we have our celebrities and celebrities for being what they are, but having someone that's looked up to in society mm -hmm. that then lends their voice to it. And it's like, hey, I've got a two week vacation. I'm gonna go plant white bark seedlings. Can you imagine if the, the social, the people that are on the TV and all that stuff, if they did that rather than being like, oh, I went off with a, on a boat and had a vacation, but they were like, I gave something back to this country that's given so much to me. So that finding those, those people that are out there and amplifying our voice. Um, so we have, imagine all these different circles and we have, the, we have the data, we have the lifestyle, and we have the tools to do that. So the medicine is the DNA, finding the resistant ones, funding the plantations, getting them there. The data is we know how much of the, land is on public service land and, and what they're experiencing. And then the third component of that lifestyle, we get all three of them to overlap, then they, they support each other. But we, the lifestyle component is underappreciated and under leveraged. And that's part of our goal with this awareness building here this evening is to get the word out. Fantastic, thanks. Walter, were you gonna add something on that one as well? I was just gonna say the fact that this film and the Clark's Nutcracker film are gonna be playing at, the Yellow, at two Yellowstone visitor centers every summer. Yellowstone gets in excess of four million people visiting every year. Of them, about 75% are there for the first time. So it's, for many people, it's a once in a lifetime trip. If just one out of three, one out of four people see these films, that's close to a million people a year. And I think because it is the, the footage and, and the story is so compelling, probably there'll be a you know, significant uh, portion of those people who's like, wow, this is a really cool, interesting uh, project. And if we can then have some information for them to add to, to, to add to their understanding that you can just uh, maybe photograph a, a barcode and then learn more about it and how you can participate, right there I think that we have uh, we've already identified the interested people. They're at Yellowstone or Glacier. They've already shown an interest because they're seeing this film. And if they get inspired and then uh, get, search for more information, we are creating ambassadors. Fantastic. And that, I think, is really how, how, you know, one, one thing, just, just off the top of my head, without us having to go, go much further. Yeah, fantastic. Well, please uh, help, uh, join me in thanking our panelists. data, 51% of mature white bark pine are dead across its range. This is fairly recent and the statistics are going south very, very, very quickly. Okay, and one thing we didn't say was that there is variation across its range and how badly off white bark pine is. It's very badly off in the northern Rockies, very badly. Uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, a little bit better in the Sierra because it's taken a longer time for blister rust to get down there. Blister rust came into the country by accident, entering in the Pacific Northwest, and it's been just spreading across the range of white bark and some of white bark's relatives for a century. Super.
Um, I think, uh, I th well, maybe we can squeeze in one more. Go ahead. Well, it depends. If the infection is in a branch, you can cut the branch off, but uh, there's a very good probability that tree is susceptible and um, not resistant, so it's not going to help perpetuate resistance. If it's a stem canker in the trunk, there's nothing you really can do, unfortunately. They've, uh, they've tried fungicides, other things, and they don't really do the trick, especially for 56 million acres of White Park Pine. And, and let's do this. We're going to have a reception afterwards, so great chance to have more discussion uh, with our panelists and others and, and get into uh, exactly all these kinds of interesting details and how people can get involved. So th again, thank you to our panelists. So I am, uh, we're heading to the close here, um, and um, so we just have two last things. Um, I want to check, is, is Director Stone Manning with us? Oh, fantastic. Uh, great. Well, we are so honored to have the Director of the Bureau of Land Management, and actually we'll have our panelists can go ahead and uh, step down. Thank you. So I was blocking the way there. Thanks. So we are is so grateful uh, that the director of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, Tracy Stone Manning, was able to join us. And I had to double check because she was squeezing this into an incredibly busy schedule and it's very generous of you to make the time um, to be with us. And the Bureau of Land Management under Director Stone Manning's leadership is making ecological restoration an absolute forefront of how they're driving land management for all of the different objectives of the agency, biodiversity and community and climate and much more. And so uh, we're being grateful to have BLM as a core partner in this effort to save the white bark pine, including um, some deep dive partnerships in Montana and Idaho and other places. So I'm excited to welcome you up, uh, Director Stone Manning, to the stage. Thank you. Seriously, I'm standing between you and the reception. That's bad. Um, it is really delightful to be here, really delightful to be here with people from home. Uh, I have a bunch of Montanans in the house. Um, uh, here I am standing in Washington, D.C. Um, but join me for a moment. I know you saw it on the film, but uh, indulge me, please. Join me for a moment and go uh, where the white bark pine are. So if you could close your eyes uh, and if you are where the white bark pine are, it's really quiet. And maybe it's broken by wind. And then you hear, Ack! Ack! <laughs> and there is the beloved Clark's Nutcracker. Um, and every time I come across a Clark's Nutcracker, I realize uh, I have arrived uh, into a different place, um, a place where, um, uh, nature really still drives and people are small. Um, and so it's partly why I love white bark pine so much um, because uh, it tells me where I am on the landscape uh, and uh, that place is a really remarkable place. So thank you everyone in this room, A, for caring and B, for doing something about caring uh, about this remarkable species. I'm gonna um, spend a few minutes uh, talking about the BLM's work and, um, and, then, and then just touch a little bit on the white bark pine work. Um, the Bureau of Land Management is the country's largest land management agency, maybe not of uh, white bark pine, but certainly of acres. We, are, we have the honor of um, managing 245 million acres, one in 10 acres in this country. Um, and in this time uh, uh, of climate change and unprecedented change on the landscape, uh, we are thinking, okay, well, how, how do we do our work? And the answer is partly good news. It's through partnerships, right? We are um, conservation, we are underfunded. Um, and so, uh, but what we, we can leverage um, the Bureau and the scale of our work through working with 
with others, like American forests, like scientists, like the Salish Kootenai. And um, those partnerships are only going to grow and grow and grow in the future, A, because they have to, um, and B, because now we have resources to make that happen. I am, um, I've had the in tremendous honor in my career to work um, around restoration, uh, first around river restoration and forest restoration and see the palpable power of it, um, the way it brings communities together, the way it um, makes humans realize that uh, we have the ability to manage perhaps for our management mistakes. Um, and now we've got the resources through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the, the Congress and President Biden <clears throat> have brought remarkable resources to bear on restoring natural systems in our country, understanding that nature is the very best engineer on the planet. And so therefore, if we're to address climate change, we need to enlist the best, the best engineer on the planet, and that's nature. So uh, you'll see investments coming um, in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars um, into nature. And it's my hope that um, we do a couple things with that, both at the Bureau and with the country. Um, the first is learn from it, right? We're gonna make mistakes. Um, we have to bring some humility to bear on this work uh, because uh, we don't, as the landscape changes before our very eyes, we're not, we're not always going to be right on how that change plays out. Um, so uh, we need to bring some humility, um, we need to bring partnership, uh, and we need to bring a feedback loop so we can learn from the things that we're doing on the landscape and uh, take those cues from nature, the, from the best engineer on the planet, nature, um, and, uh, and put those cues right back into the landscape. So as, uh, as the Salish and Kootenai tribe employs young people to scale trees and put cages around uh, cones to collect those seeds, I had this moment of thinking, I could do that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> And, uh, but I can, uh, I can sing its praises and I can go out and watch people do that. Um, uh, we're gonna learn from that and we're gonna learn about what's uh, genetically resistant and what is not. Um, and we're gonna be able to tell the story about the power of nature and the power of how uh, something as beautiful as a Clark's and obnoxious as a Clark's nutcracker um, has uh, has this beautiful relationship with a place and with a species. Um, and I am enough of an optimist to believe that we can learn from those relationships, bring them to bear with the power of government, um, bring them to bear through partnerships uh, with uh, people who came here before us and their indigenous knowledge, um, and set a trajectory through these investments that will um, literally and figuratively pay off in the end. So again, thank you so much for this work. Um, it matters, you all matter, um, because this place, this species, uh, really, really matters. Thank you, everybody. I'm so grateful to you, Director Stone Manning, for really bringing climate into this conversation, uh, maybe a little bit more than we have so far tonight, because climate change is a driver of uh, the loss of white bark pine, and, and uh, Diana Tomback spoke to that, and all the different ways in which that's manifesting. We need white bark pine for climate change resilience. We also need a white bark pine to help us slow climate change down. I mean, our trees and forests in the United States currently capture about 17% of our carbon dioxide emissions. And the thing is, that can go up or it can go down. That's not a fixed rate. And so when we lose a species like the white bark pine at scale, that's uh, constraining the ability of our trees and forests to help us a slow climate change. So you talk about feedback loops. That's a really important feedback loop. The health and vitality of our forests, um, when it goes up, our ability to fight climate change goes up. And when it declines, it actually makes that job of slowing climate change even harder. Just so yet another really critical reason why we absolutely have to get this right. Um, and so we, we said we wanted to make tonight about, this is a comeback story. This is, tonight's kind of the, this is the halftime of, of, you know, a game where we're about to turn it around in the second half here. And so I want to leave us with a couple of really important reminders. 
And one that we haven't talked about too much here, but I want to double underscore, is that we can restore this species by working with nature and the power of the Clark's nutcracker. That once we get to about 20 to 30 percent healthy white bark st pine stands um, within a particular focus area, the, the Clark's nutcracker kind of gets supercharged in its ability to help us. And so there's a really positive synergy that gets going working with nature. I also want to remind us of one really powerful reality that roughly 90% of whitebark pine is on public lands in the United States. And so these are the lands, again, that we own, manage together, um, and have a unique opportunity uh, to drive restoration in these uh, special uh, places. And so, uh, you know, Director Stone Manning talked about the role of these incredible investments that were made in the last Congress through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. And I want to call that one is that Weed American Forces see as such a sign of hope, which is the Replant Act. And this was a particular provision within the infrastructure bill, a bipartisan provision that was then moved into the bipartisan infrastructure bill because it had such broad support to essentially fix a problem with the reforestation trust fund that the US Forest Service uses to fund reforestation and to open up the full potential of those dollars to help us accelerate reforestation of our national forest system, which is seeing so many stresses and forest health challenges. Um, and so uh, by current revenue levels, we'll get about a nine-fold increase in potential funding uh, from that fund to accelerate restoration of the white bark pine and other species that are being lost on national forests across the country. So we can do this together. We, we, we've shown it with uh, you know, acts, efforts uh, like everything you've heard here tonight. We've shown it with fantastic bipartisan uh, policy efforts like the Replant Act and other funding measures I don't have time to get into uh, that Director Stone Manning was alluding to. Um, so I just want to close with four key things that I want to be sure we all walk out with a, you know, a couple of key actions that we're anchoring on is what needs to get done to get this right and then a call to action to all of you. So one is that we must scale up planting in these core areas on, on federal and tribal lands that can be the strongholds of resilience. And this new plan that we've spoken about a few times, this new National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan will be really helpful to us in identifying those places where we need to double down and accelerate planting. And, and just as by way of example, American Forests and the Forest Service, working with great corporate partners, like I mentioned, Salesforce is here tonight, have already uh, uh, helped to plant uh, almost a, a million white bark pine uh, in efforts like that. We can do that and we can do a lot more of it uh, now bringing public and private uh, funding together. The second is we must increase seed collection and expand nursery capacity. And we've heard fantastic efforts, tribal efforts in that regard. We've heard uh, public sector, private sector efforts in that regard. But if we don't have not just more seedlings, the right seedlings to plant, resilient seedlings to plant, we can't be successful here. And so we've got to get the front end of the reforestation pipeline built out um, so it can match the level of reforestation that we want to do. Uh, it was so great that uh, Diana Tombach spoke uh, in the end of her remarks about innovations in science and research uh, that we can combine with tr traditional ecological knowledge to make sure that we are being as efficient as possible in identifying those resilient uh, trees and in how we raise those seedlings and other kinds of innovations in terms of even new efficiencies in doing the reforestation as well. So we really need to lean into the innovation side of this equation. Um, and then lastly, when that National White Bark Pine Restoration Plan is done, it's not going to uh, implement itself. Um, those federal dollars that I've ref we've referenced here tonight, they're not going to spend themselves. And so we need to have the partnerships where we're thinking about what are the barriers to implementation, what are the barriers to scale, um, and how do we create partnerships um, that are knocking those down and are getting us where, where we need to go, um, and all sorts of different ways that we can, that we can make that happen. So lastly, um, I want to just give you all a call to action, um, which is that we, we need to broaden uh, the community of people who are coming in on this. We hope that this film, and have a belief that this film, when it gets out there into the world, if it, if it affected you the way it affected me the first time I saw this film, and, and how we imagine it's going to affect people across America, we hope this is going to create a rallying around the white bark pine work. But again, that won't happen by accident either. 
we need you to help share this film, share the things that you've heard here tonight. So there's actually a QR code in your program that you can use to go to uh, a site called savethewhitebarkpine.org, um, which both uh, has a link to the film as well as provides a lot of uh, information for anyone who wants a one-stop shop to figure out how they can help. So we need you to be an evangelist uh, for Save the White Bark Pine. Get that website out there, push this film. It's going to be uh, playing in the DC Environmental Film Festival tomorrow, which is a really prestigious uh, recognition of, of the power of this film. And so if you know people in the DC area, we hope you encourage them to actually see it live uh, when it, uh, here tomorrow. Um, but again, let's, let's really push this um, through social media and just networking in other ways um, to, to, to directly bring as many people as we can um, uh, into, uh, into this, uh, to this work. And then also just here tonight, um, we can network right here uh, in the room. And so we're gonna have a reception afterwards. We hope that you'll ask our experts some of the questions we didn't have time to get to today. We hope you'll uh, walk up to somebody you don't know and ask how they're, what they're doing on White Bark Pine and see if we can foster some new connections and partnerships uh, here tonight. Because it's gonna take everyone, it's gonna take all of us in getting our efforts together in powerful new ways. But let's do this, let's save the White Bark Pine. I thought the film was impactful. I've never heard about this problem before. I think that's a great way to raise awareness. I feel way more informed and educated. It was wonderful and I hope a lot of people get to see this. My call to action is to tell more people, to share the stories. Of all the nature films that I've ever seen, it's the one that really touched me in a way that like, you know, brings hope to a big problem that we can actually solve.